Hey guys, this is Stephanie Lemlin, and I play the computer, and also Artemis, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-01. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D-12. Hello team, and welcome to Scream Something Volume 8. My name is Rich, and I am here with my co-host Emily. Hey everybody, in Scream Something, Rich and I will be sharing our initial thoughts and reactions for the episodes of Season 3 that were released the last two Tuesdays. There will be plenty of Aster in these episodes, but we'll be saving our deeper analysis for the full episode breakdowns we have planned for after the season finale. Son of a... You're all working together! Mr. I don't join teams, Grayson takes me on a rogue mission to Granny's house? Where we're rescued by the co-chair of the Justice League and a Bat Family drone? That's on me. I can explain. Oh, I'm sure it is. And I'm sure you can. But it doesn't stop there. Or start there for that matter. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The titles of this week's episodes are Antisocial Pathologies and Terminus. Totally normal episode names. <laughs> The release dates were August 13th and August 20th. The in-episode dates were January 22nd through 25th. The directors were Christopher Berkeley and Mel Zwire, and the writers were Rich Vogel and Brandon Vietti. Just in time for your next mission. Episode 22 opens with a meeting of the light recapping last week's episode and Ultra Humanite and Gretchen Good arguing over who gets to claim Halo. We then cut over to Slade ambushing Tara for a meeting in Hollywood. Slade's starting to doubt her loyalties and warns her that the second she steps out of line, the heroes won't hesitate to take her down. So he gives her something to protect herself, and we don't get to see what it is. It's fine. It'll be fine. Uh, Back at the premiere building, Nightwing is still struggling to recover from the X-Pit. I was worried for good reason. Uh... (laughs) While there, Bruce calls an emergency kitchen meeting of the anti-light, but (laughs) Jefferson puts the pieces together, makes a very public call out of all of them, and gives us a season recap in the process. Nicely nicely done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And while all of this is going down, Dr. J slaps a mind control chip on Tara and kidnaps her and Brion and convinces Halo to come along as well by telling her that she's finally found a cure for her condition because Jace is evil. (laughs) We'll get to it. Um, And back at the hub, everybody's confronting everybody. Jefferson's shouting at Bruce and Calder. (laughs) McGann and Connor are having a telepathic argument, and Garfield's cornered Tim and Barbara, who confirm that most of the Outsiders' major missions were in some way orchestrated by the Anti-Light. And nobody's apologizing for any of it. It's fine. <laughs> right. At Jace's lab, Gretchen Good and Ultra Humanite walk in and subdue Violet with Apocalyptin Tech. And this isn't quite how Jace thought their deal was going to go, but she's willing to cooperate as Gretchen shows her of course she is. what she has planned for Halo. Is. Transporting. I am curious. Oh, yeah, of course you are, Jace. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because Gretchen Good then uh, transports all of them to the X-Pit and reveals that Halo's reflexive healing aura is the key to the anti-life equation. That thing. Back at the premiere building, Barbara also calls out Bruce on the whole anti light concept herself. You go, girl. We'll get to it. Uh, and in the X-Pit, Gretchen reveals that combining Halo's powers with the power of the ghost dimension will take away a person's free will and make the brainwashing of the X-Pit permanent. A theory that she then tests by pushing Jace out into the X-Pit and telling her to reveal all her secrets. Um, And it turns out she's an evil delusional woman who views Tara and Brion as her children because of the metagene testing she did on them and now wants to kidnap them, destroy Halo and continue her metagene work to quote unquote expand their family. 
Hashtag Jace did everything wrong. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dr. Jace is now officially mind controlled by Granny, but Tara frees her brother from his control chip and reveals to us, the audience, that what Slade gave her earlier was a patch to counteract mind control tech. The siblings fight back, but the villains escape, taking Violet with them. The light debriefs after everything's gone down, but Vandal Savage doesn't seem too happy to hear about the anti-life equation. And the Markovs return to the premiere building, breaking the news to Jefferson and insisting that they've got to go find Halo. Out in space, we see Gretchen Good deliver Halo to Granny Goodness, because apparently there's two of them. I'm still a little unclear. Uh <laughs> And, You're not alone on this one. And to, I'm not exactly sure what's going on here. This might be a fourth world wackiness thing that I uh, we might need to talk to Professor Stormer about and see if there's a thing. We'll see. Uh, and to we'll see. close out the episode, Tara makes a phone call to Slade to tell him that he was right about the heroes being untrustworthy and asking what he needs her to do now. Oh. What could go wrong? What could go wrong? It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I have so... So many, so many thoughts. But let's get on to the next lighthearted episode, episode 23. Opening in space as the Justice League attempts to attack the orphanage to rescue the captured metateens that we saw earlier this season. <laughs> However, it all goes terribly wrong. The orphanage sets off its huge torture device as well as Halo's powers and successfully enslaves every present member of the League. Re think that's true? Yeah, I didn't actually count. Were the Hawks there? I don't even know. We have to go back it's and see. It's not the entire be league, but it's everybody who was yeah. there. Definitely everybody who was present. Back in Hollywood, Connor and McGann have a discussion about her involvement in the Anti-Light. McGann says she did it to protect everyone. Connor says, it's a little too reminiscent of pretty much everything that happened in season two and the end of season one. And they're interrupted before McGann can respond because Vandal Savage has shown up at their doorstep. Just a normal day in the <laughs> life of a superhero. <laughs> I did not see that coming. Uh, he'll give them the coordinates to find Halo just so long as they inform Granny that he was the one who sent them. The whole team, including Nightwing, Calder, and Brion, all boom tube to the orphanage. The kids go off to track down Halo, while the adults realize that the Justice League is also on board and probably mind-controlled. <clears throat> because, yeah... <laughs> Because this whole thing's a flashback to season one. The Furies and a group of parademons attack Alpha Squad, and during the fight, Nightwing gets hurt and falls into a fever-induced dream, hallucinating that Kid Flash is present and helping them and experiencing the battle as if he and the rest of the original team were teenagers again, and eventually takes down the enemies using the Javelin's drone attacks. Meanwhile, Geoforce, Forager, and Terra locate Halo, but before they can rescue her, they're attacked by the mind-controlled Justice League. As the rest of the team approaches, Calder insists that McGann needs to brain blast everyone to level the playing field. And despite Superboy's objections, McGann agrees to sacrifice her soul, she says, her mental well-being. Like, that's something to, save, to unpack to and save we're the universe. To it. <laughs> at the center, are you prepared to stop me? Uh, at the center of the orphanage, Granny lays out her plan and is about to put it into action when the team arrives on the scene. And Miss Martian psychically attacks everyone. But before they can do almost anything, Granny manages to push Halo into the ghost dimension and successfully mind controls everyone in the room, as far as we know, and sends that energy out into the solar system to kickstart the age of anti-life. This is fine, Rich. <sighs> it's fine. I got an elongated man, so I'm happy. <laughs> that was my highlight. I was like, hey, it's that guy. And then two minutes later, they're like, Poof! And like oh, a okay. weird, okay. weird confirmation that he's not a metahuman, which I have thoughts on. Anyway, let's move on to feeling the aster because that's the most important part of these two episodes. I mean, <laughs> elongated man isn't a metahuman. <laughs> what did guy call him? Flongated man. I don't remember. Uh... <laughs> let's feel the aster. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. Ralph Dibney, man. Ralph Dibney's the best. <laughs> Totally underrated, stretchy man. Nice. So after literal months of saying, wow, it's really weird that Jace refers to Brion, Tara, and Halo as her kids, I feel very validated that the show oh, acknowledged- Oh, God. It's the worst. That it's the worst. That's, that's so much worse. 
than I was expecting. On the upside, uh, Morgan Jenkins, we weren't right about the <laughs> Anna and Otto theory. We were so spectacular. You were right. Wrong. It's totally worse. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh. So much worse. <laughs> I like that entire scene was me sitting here in front of my computer being like, oh, no, oh, oh, it gets wor- Oh, every line you say makes this worse. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. I when I rewatched it specifically just right before we were recording today, just to get everything fresh in my mind. I skipped right past that whole section. <laughs> I was like, it's uncomfortable. I have got I've got almost exactly 40 minutes to like go through these two episodes just to get some of these scenes fresh in my mind and I was like, yeah, I don't want any of that right now. <laughs> well, I'll we'll get into that anything that I need to get into that. We'll get into that in the individual episodes cuz man, I talk about bad dads on this show. Uh Jefferson. Buddy. What about him? <laughs> I, I, everything, <laughs> his whole life blew up. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh it exploded. Yeah. Everything, both see both episodes blew up. Oh. No lines in the second episode yet. Yeah. He had not a single line in the second episode. But that entire subplot in the second episode that we didn't even include in our recap because I was like, I can't explain what this is doing uh, is some A plus silent storytelling. Yeah. Every time they cut back to it, I was like, is he gonna have a line of dust? Di- no. Okay. Nope. This is a thing we're doing. And it's a really interesting yeah. little background arc for that whole episode. Like when I was watching it, that op- uh, that opening scene with just him and Virgil sitting on the beach and that held shot of them sitting there, I kept sitting there being like, okay, you can cut away now because I'm just like, like uncomfortable in a way that hurts. Like, yeah. good. Like, they're doing their job right because I'm just sitting there being like, oh, this is painful. Yeah. Yeah. It's just tough. And and what's kind of great is that, like, Jeff's got his thing he's working through. Virgil's trying to help. It's not working because <laughs> he gives him a hot dog. The most, like, I don't know, subtexted hot dog in history. <laughs> and he, he gives him. So, but afterwards, when Jefferson and Virgil, like, are walking back. You know, and he's dropping Virgil off at his house. He's like, you know, basically like, it's okay. Yeah. Like, thank you for, thank you for being, what you, what you did is probably more than you think. And all simply translated into just a very quick fist bump offered by Jefferson. Yeah. Not offered by Virgil. Not Virgil putting it up there saying like, come on, buddy. It was, it was Jefferson saying like, this, this, this did matter. Be patient with me. Like, there's just so much like wrapped up in just that one body action there. And then the thing at the end, man, I tell you, there's a there's a thing that your kids can do <laughs> to and for you that you don't realize. My wife and I are going through this right now, where our son is very uh, perceptive and has no filter for facial expressions. <laughs> so I was working through some issues la- earlier in the week, and my son had asked me to play with him. So I was I was in the room with him, but he was very aware that I wasn't in the room with him because I was upset about something. That had nothing to do with him. And he he just looked at me, four years old. He's all, Papa, yeah? You have grumpy face on. (laughs) And I was like, you're right, buddy. I do. That's that's not okay for now. I can put that away. Let's play. And then play. And that's exactly what I saw Jefferson do with his kids. Where after all of that stuff, like justifiably having his life blow up in front of him, all of his friends, his lover, everything blow up getting through that and needing a little time with that. But then having the kids just full of like joy and love and experiencing life and passion right in the face. So good. And not a word spoken. That's good. It's really good. So speaking of superhero dads, I don't know what my segue is here. I actually really, that first episode and the very (sighs) beginning of the first episode of these two Getting to see the super concerned Bat family was really nice in some sort of way. Like these episodes are painful and every detail in these episodes is painful. But I liked that they included that everybody shows up and that Bruce is kind of 
terrified or as terrified as we ever see Batman because yeah. his son He's worried. is on the brink of death at the moment. And that's a lot. Yeah. And he doesn't know what to do. And, yeah. Like, I can fight villains. I can make plans. I can deal with intergalactic threats. His brain swelling. I got nothing. Right? And to, to be in that space where you're so out of your element medically, man, that, that's a real thing. Yeah. You know, and which a real thing to me in some ways, I think now that I'm now that we're talking about it, I think can make a lot of sense why he leans so far into the anti light thing in this episode, why he's so like, this is this is what we have to do, because he's like, I can't control that. I can control this. Yes. And this is something that comes up all the time in my job as, as a hospice nurse and even as an ICU nurse, because sometimes you don't understand why either, you know family members or, or a patient who's sick or a patient who's literally dying can't, they're, they're, why they make the choices they make. And so many times it's because they can't control certain things about what's happening. And so they pick a thing they can control, even if it doesn't make any sense to us. And they say, I can't change my situation. I can't help. I can't do these things. But you know what I can do or not do? I don't have to take that medicine. I don't care how much you tell me it's good for me. I can control my agency in this point, right? And it's exactly it. It's exactly it. You know, same thing with kids, right? Sometimes they act out because they have, they don't feel like they have control over their situation or agency in, in a choice someplace else. So they will make agency in a choice that doesn't make any sense to us because they want to express that. And it's exactly what Bruce is doing here. You just nailed it. I didn't even think about that. Neither did I until we did. The, this is why we podcast. I know, right? Therapy for us. Exactly. That's what it is. Yeah. Uh, and again, speaking of another far worse father figure on this show, every flashback scene between Tara and Slade makes me viscerally uncomfortable, which is what they want it to do, but it's true. He that one flashback we get in this in that in 22 shows just how clearly he has off-screen abused and conditioned her in horrible ways that i don't think tara is even aware of because yeah. the fact that she lashes out and all he has to do is raise his voice and she cowers and then hugs him simply because he doesn't hurt her is horrible and gross yeah. and it hurt me to watch yeah every single time it's so yeah absolutely that whole situation is awful and complicated and i really hope somebody can help tara out of that we need to help this girl uh Whew. yeah i hate slade but this situation right here it, it, it is a it is so much better than judas contract oh yeah yeah a lot of things are better it's, than judas contract yeah, yeah this is better it may not be the right word this is this is brutal but you can see what's going on and it's uncomfortable in a different way i'm not yeah, quite sure how to know. say that now actually I now that like, i think about it but uh because it's not it's not good it's not good <laughs> no it's not, not good a, at all it's not good choices being made by anyone but it's no. it's writing that makes me uncomfortable for the right reasons right you know what i mean I think, yeah yeah, and I look at Tara in that, you know, like, what do you want me to do on the phone? And I'm just like, there it is. That's a believable. Yeah. She has agency in her choices. She's not, she is a tool of someone else, but she is making the best decisions she can with the choices, with the information that she has. Yeah. Or she was given, I, right? I really, really love and appreciate that tara's turn is about actually witnessing all of the heroes betraying each other and having someone who she trusted kidnap her like having that be her turning point of like oh oh everyone here is awful is like oh that makes sense yeah. this isn't they're just you each were other, taught that the yeah. good guys are bad this is you witnessing the good guys at their worst moment <laughs> yeah pretty much uh the other thing i found interesting that was kind of subtle and i didn't quite understand yes Brion was like i don't understand is bruce wayne dick grayson's dad and i was like okay I i'm not sure how to put this together like 
then I went back and thought about it, and I'm like, he's known Dick without his mask on since almost the beginning of knowing Nightwing. He's called him Dick. They trained without masks or costumes. He revealed a secret identity to him. So, one, either somehow Dick Grayson is not widely known as Bruce Wayne's adopted son, which seems strange, but would also explain why they cut that scene. But the fact that that scene was there at all, the scene where Artemis points out, like, the fact that that was in a script at one point and was seemingly cut for time, like, because by the time it gets to storyboarding and stuff, that yeah. wasn't edited out for content. That was edited out that, for that's timing true. and flow. Makes me think that people know, Brion just might not know, because he's not from America. <laughs> right, so you have Forager, Halo, Brion, presumably Tara? Maybe? Or maybe not? Yes. So they must, they got to know. <laughs> I don't know. My head's having a hard time wrapping around this. They got to know Bruce's Batman, which means his secret identity is spreading. They might not know he's Bat. They might know he's Batman. I don't know, man. No one's good at keeping secrets in this group anymore. <laughs> it's true. I just found it interesting that you can't just look that up or that wouldn't have been a thing. Like that Brion wouldn't have been like, oh, Dick Grayson. I mean, we all have holes in our- Do you look up our... everyone's, everyone's family tree when you meet them for the first time, Rich? <laughs> no, that's fair. But if it's Nightwing, I'm going to be like, who is this Dick Grayson person? How did you get to be in this place? And you, I mean, you got to be able to Google Dick Grayson and then it's going to pop up, right? I don't know. Anyway, I found it interesting. Or what does that mean? What's the implications there? Like, I don't know. I was going to say, I feel like over time, maybe Dick Grayson as a as a persona, quote unquote, has become much less of a public figure after he like doesn't live with Bruce Wayne anymore. Maybe. Maybe. It's possible. He, he lives in a little apartment in Bloodhaven, <laughs> like we've seen it in the comics. He's not <laughs> he's not rich boy living it up like Bruce Wayne is. It's true. He is not pushing the Playboy persona. Uh that's that's a true statement. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> we don't know. It's not nearly Maybe it's not nearly Bri as Brio Brion has a one track mind. He was interested right. in Googling only like three things. <laughs> he didn't right. care. Markovia. Meta trafficking. Right. He was on his phone so much. None of this is as important as elongated man. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> That's all you can. Anyway. About these. Barbara, you were talking about Barbara. At Barbara, one point too. I really I love with Barbara's role in twenty two that she, on the one hand, makes some actually pretty valid points about the existence of the anti light. Like hearing her explain it to Garth Garfield, I was like, okay. I can see how you got here and why you would yeah. think this. I can understand yeah. and believe this, and I can almost see how this might seem like a good plan. I don't think it's a good plan, but I can see how it's kind of a good plan. But what I really love is when she goes and talks to Bruce and just calls him out on how we put together a team that is entirely made up of current or former sidekicks because they're all used to taking orders from Batman and nobody's going to question that Batman knows what he's doing. It hadn't crossed my mind until she said it that everyone on that team is under the age of 24. And I'm like, yeah, that's those. And, and <laughs> even if they were direct sidekicks, he gave them all the missions for the original team. Yeah. Right. So like there's still there's still a power differential there. <laughs> Right, it's like Cal Calder may be leading the Justice League, but he was still looking to Batman for advice for most of his superhero career. Like, yep. I, and it had. Thinking even, about downtime, right? Yeah, downtime. Yeah. Yep. Just playing through my head on repeat, like, oh, exactly. Oh, look at that. <laughs> that opening scene. <laughs> yes. Because that's absolutely what he did, and he can say he didn't. But I, I also love that Barbara's like, "What mission are you talking about?" Because Bruce doesn't specify. It's just like the mission. What does that mean? Clarify. What are you talking about? Yeah. And who? Who? Whose mission? Whose mission? Yeah. What mission? Exactly. Explain some things. Yeah. So you've been shouting about elongated man <laughs> this whole episode. 
But that same scene where we see Elongated Man for the first time, one thing that I noticed, even on my first viewing, we all know Guy Gardner is a trash man. He's <laughs> but a trash man. I actually really liked the fact that during that scene where the X pit goes off, he doesn't flinch no. for a second. He doesn't. It's a reminder of why Guy Gardner, as much as w- most of us are like, eh, trash fire of a human. <laughs> There's a reason he's a Green Lantern, because he has the willpower. Yes. He's, he's going through that. And I'm like, oh, I'm yeah. a little bit impressed by you, you trash man. <laughs> yeah. And I, I may have been I may have been reading into this, but in that scene later on where you're, where they're Granny's talking about how the non-metas don't react well Hal and john are like looking pretty rough and guy yeah he's a little twitchy but he's not nearly looking as rough as either of the lanterns or elongated man who's looking real rough there buddy yeah so uh, what is your theory what is your theory there just that guy is just is just has too much willpower that's all that's what i can think of (laughs) That's the same. It's the same thing. I put it in my notes too, and I didn't notice it the first. I didn't notice it at all the first time I watched it. I noticed it when I was rewatching it to, you know, freshen my memory, you yeah. know, for this recording. And I was just like, Superman's like, Aah! guy is not moving one iota. He's not moving at all. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let's do like everyone has their place in the universe. Guy's place is. A willpower filled trash fire. <laughs> yeah. He's the strongest uh, trash fire. It's the strong. <laughs> We're so mean to Guy Gardner. He must have some redeeming traits to be a Green Lantern, but. Batman did punch him in the face one time, <laughs> which is really funny to me. A plus. <laughs> oh, it's funny. I don't like randomly punching people, but <laughs> guy, guy needed that. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I have a question for you, though. Yeah, what's your question? I think I just don't remember this. Yes. They were, Connor and McGann were are sitting and they're having a conversation and she said something about like, you yelled at me last time or you were yelling at me recently. Something, something to the effect of like, they were just having a conversation and, and they were, he was yelling at her. And I kind of vaguely, there was a scene, right? Where they were having a telepathic conversation that we didn't hear what it was and other people were out, were looking at it. Right. Yes. Was that what she was referring to, or did I did I just forget something? Yes. As far as I know, hi. Super Martian questions are directed at Emily. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, be, that entire a thing I found interesting about episode twenty two is McGann and Connor are having an entire subplot that we never hear. They don't have a single line of dialogue, despite the fact that they are talking to each other that entire episode, because they are having a telepathic conversation that entire episode. That I, gotta, is, I gotta go watch that again. It's yeah. it's really cool, and I kept picking up on it. It was like, oh, from like at, once everyone starts like confronting everybody, they're just up in the balcony silently like shouting at each other, and you can only <laughs> tell that they're shouting at each other because of like Superboy's body they're language like hands or something. Like, yeah, Superboy's exactly. talking with his hands and saying nothing because this <laughs> is just what get, they do. We finally, know what Satana was feeling like in the first right? season. And so McGann's line at the start of that is, you yelled at me and it's been silent treatment since then. Because that yeah. episode starts a couple of days after the after episode 22. So yeah. they just haven't been talking and now they are sitting down to like actually have a conversation about this that only gets interrupted by Vandal Savage. And despite the fact that multiple people on Twitter were like, are you okay after this episode? To which I responded to no one because I don't want to spoil these amazing episodes for anybody who follows me. I actually really like that this scene exists and that it's yeah. an important conversation and they're going out of their way to show us them having this conversation and that they're both actually willing to sit down and talk <laughs> about this. Like, I yeah. like that the conversation we see isn't them shouting at each other. It's them being like, we took a few days. Let's talk. And the fact yeah. that like, like we've been saying with this whole season, I like that they are giving these two most of their plot is them like discussing actual problems and trying to work through things. And 
I think the fact that like I was a little bit worried at first with the scene, I was like, oh, this is we're going to go down a path that is going to be dark for these last three episodes. And I do think that's happening in general. But the fact that this dynamic, the way it comes up later is Connor going out of his way to be like, no, you can't just order my girlfriend to do something that is detrimental to her mental well-being and that Connor's the one looking out for her on that front, that it's not him being like, no, that's morally wrong. It's no, that hurts her. Yeah. Speaks volumes to how much I think both of them have grown and how willing they are to actually work through problems instead of just walking away from them. Yeah. I think, and part of it is like, I think he's, this is what I think. I think he's trying to scramble to, to figure out why she would make this decision. Yes, I agree. And he's trying to tell her like, look, no, you didn't like change someone's mind directly with telepathy and reprogram someone, but he's right. Lies program people, right? Deathstroke programming Tara with lies. Yes. Right. People are, people making the, trying to make the best decisions they can with the information they have. And other people feeling like they need to twist or give, you know, alternate information or whatever, you know, it's, it's messed up and, and he's right on that front. Yeah. So he's trying to rationalize what that is. And then he literally hears, you know, Calder, another member of this, you know, anti-light saying, you need to do this thing, this terrible, terrible thing that you and Connor have been talking about for the last eight years about not doing or however long it's been. Two years. (laughs) Seven. Well... Yeah, I guess too. Like this, uh, this wasn't a yeah. thing that came up in season one. <laughs> right, right, absolutely, absolutely, that's true. But it ca- it started coming up between seasons one and two, is what I was thinking. Yeah. So, some point in time between seasons one and two, by the time we even get to the invasion, and by the time we see, like, he's already worried about what she's doing and why she's doing it before season two even starts. So I wasn't, you're right though, much shorter than that time. Not to, anyway, not to be a stickler about timeline. They break up only like two months before season two starts. These are the facts I remember. <laughs> yes, but they broke up because she was going to change his mind. So yeah. That doesn't mean she wasn't yeah. doing other things before then that made him like, whoa, now you're doing it to me? Like of all the people, like, you know, that's the way I looked at it. Anyway, point, <laughs> point is. The point is, not that. What's the point, Rich? The point is elongated man. <laughs> anyway, so, so. Put it on a t-shirt. He's trying, he's trying. <laughs> sorry, uh, you're trying Ra- to make Ra- actual Dibney. points. I'm sorry. I think I was. I don't know. Anyway, so, you know, so Cowler's like, I mean, uh, Connor's looking at Calder like saying, you need to do this thing. And her saying, I'm going to do it. And him just like, wait a minute. Okay, so there's external pressures going on in her decision-making process. Not that she doesn't have agency in her own decisions, but he's just like, doesn't help when people she loves and trusts are telling her she needs to do something that it's been a thing. It's a, it's a point. It's a, it's a button for their relationship, right? So, yeah, rough. But when he's like, do you have any idea what that's going to do to our friends? And Calder's like, seriously? No, yes, I, the thing I understand. That- the thing that I think is inc- really good about that scene is that Connor doesn't say, do you know, he starts to say, don't you realize what that does to, and before he can finish, Calder cuts him off because he thinks it's going to be, don't you know what that does to other people? And Connor's like, no, oh. no, that's not what this is about. Yeah. And like that, oh, that's that true. floored yes. me because I was like, oh, they're going to have Connor be like, we can't do this because it's wrong. And which is a completely valid point. I'm not sounding sarcastic because it's not a valid point. I mean, that like, oh, we're doing that thing. And instead, it's a point that I hadn't even considered them bringing up at all in that situation. And then the second he brought it up, I was like, no, you're you're right. We saw that in season two. And I think everybody kind of forgets that we saw that in season two. Like, McGann is wrecked after she realizes what she did to Calder. She, like, goes into I cannot use my powers mode at all. She is borderline suicidal after helping fix Calder, which... Oh, that's true. We talked about that, huh? Yeah. Like, it's a lot. And I appreciate that it gets brought up here in, like, kind of vague dialogue, like, save your soul kind of dialogue that I'm like, I'm not exactly sure what you're implying here. 
But I like that it's getting brought up, and I like that it also plays into the fact that McGann is willing to be that self-sacrificing, because we've seen that before. McGann yeah. is willing to do whatever it takes to save the people she cares about, and Connor's out here being like, okay, but you're someone I care about. You don't get to yeah. do that if it's going to destroy you. <laughs> yeah. Man, what is up? What is up with Con- Connor? Is just like he's the grounding force for like the whole team. He's so good, right? Because this isn't just him and McCann, right? He's he's getting Brion's head on straight. Yes, and then he just confronts my boy. He calls out in your boy the best the best possible way, right? Yes, like Dick, stop it. <laughs> I've had enough. I've heard enough of you. Face the reality of what's happening right now. Because we're over you. And then walks away. <laughs> Dick's like, uh, uh, what? Like, Connor's like, seriously, man. I got a lot on my plate. <laughs> Deal with your stuff. Exactly. You know? And I'm just like, yeah. Yeah, Connor. You know? Like, Because Nightwing's Dick, trying to just turn it into a joke and be like, oh, you're being a leader. And Superboy's like, shut up. You're a leader. Deal with it. Walks away. <laughs> yeah. Because Dick's doing what he does, right? And and it's it's the thing that this thing happens to us too, right? Psychologically. We make little jokes about ourselves or other people make jokes about us. And then we continue to joke about it. And then that joke about ourselves becomes over time a defining, you know, thing about ourselves, even though we maybe don't mean it. And it becomes reflexive. And his reflexive joke right now is how he doesn't want to be a leader. And I think it's because he wants to keep himself emotionally distant from people because of, because of Wally. Yeah. You know, like I, I, my first mission I ever went on, everybody died. And then my best friend died and then died and then parents died. And I have an uncle who, according to the tie in comics, I guess is paralyzed and is still in the, in the YG universe somewhere doing something. Right. Like, and then I had a, you know, a, an adopted brother die. And then, you know, it's like, boy's got issues. Why is it Nightwing to- in therapy? <laughs> Right. Send Nightwing to Black Canary. Talk through your issues. Because seriously, and this is my this is my thought on that. He's functional. He's a functional individual who shows joy at the in the face of the world as much as he possibly can. And he he is separating himself from other people to be a support to other people, but not be a part of other people. That is what's happening with him. Yeah. And because of that, he cannot see his own issues. The things that he needs, he doesn't feel like he's the important part of this equation. He feels like getting, doing, having other people do their thing is the important part of this equation. He can't be a part of it, right? So, like, I, there's so much going on, and I, I, I see him coming out the other side of this season. The more the Dick Grayson that I, that I picture in my head from the comics, right? The leader who knows who he is, like, and and what he's doing in the world, you know. Yeah. But Connor, I've had enough of your people. <laughs> Connor just wants a break. He just wants one break. <laughs> get Connor a blanket and a vacation. <laughs> can I Can I not get the one angry guy on the team and be his babysitter? Uh, yeah. No, absolutely. but I did. I did like, I know we're talking about him and Nightwing, but I really did like that conversation between him and Brion because it feels very much yeah. like connor taking a step back and like talking to himself as a teenager for a second he's like no you are absolutely allowed to go on the mission you are absolutely allowed to be worried about your significant other you just can't let that overwhelm you and make you do stupid things yeah and i love how telepathically he's able to tell forager like i'm on this i got this yeah right yeah i did yeah i like that i love i love that until you know superman and jean show up (laughs) But speaking of all that stuff on on the orphanage, we get an OG team up. We like like the second yeah. they showed like the big shot of like all of them there, I was like, oh, it's the original team minus Wally. That's that's cool. That's a cool little thing. And then the show's like, but yeah, but we're gonna make it better and worse <laughs> at the same time. I cried. I cried yeah. real tears for the entirety of that sequence. It was a beautiful, beautiful callback to season one. It really was. With a whole new word. Like, you get a whole new word development thing. And the whole, like, Nightwing hacked the javelin. I hacked the javelin. (laughs) Right? Like, every little bits and piece of that. The Hello Megans and that. We can hear you. And, like, just every single step 
of that, you know, was so it was this so well it done. was the one it was an amazing callback. It was both the joy of like seeing everyone in a fight they can win and the pain of knowing Wally isn't there and can't be there. And just that this thing that maybe I'm reading too much into, but this is how I look at stories. There's this shared emotional memory that is a diegetic element within the show that is all of them experiencing that. And gosh, I want to unpack unpack the fact that all of them went through that. And that is a thing that they just did. But it's also a shared emotional memory for the audience that I think everyone kind of felt, even if you don't have the language to kind of describe what that means and how that feels. But that scene, as a viewer, you are watching that and being like, oh, oh, I know this. That's the reason so many of us got emotional. Like, that isn't objectively an emotional scene. That is a fun fight scene with some cool throwbacks to season one. But the number of people I saw talking about it online who were like, I sobbed at this. I'm like, yeah, we all did. (laughs) Because it's that shared emotional memory that you are a part of along with those characters. Yeah. And it was so good. (laughs) That was really good. It was. And there's a lot to... I don't know. I keep just thinking about why. I mean, yes, there, there's all kinds of excuses we can make about why Wally keeps showing up. <laughs> right. Maybe not excuses, but like reasons. Right. Like, you know, yeah. I mean, he's a fan favorite. And he was in season, you know, seasons one and two and his death. And, you know, it's good to make sure that we're getting nods to him. But he's showing up in some really existential places. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I can't help but keep that in mind. So we haven't talked about a lot about Kid Flash. I don't know. I don't necessarily know why we've been avoiding the conversation of whether we think Wally's going to come back or not. I still, I still don't know. I think part of me doesn't want to throw out a bunch of theories and ideas about whether or not he's coming back. And this is like seems like the number one question that we see online and with people sending us emails and Twitter DMs. So is he in the Speed Force? Is he in a time stream lost somewhere? Is he get jumped into the future? Is he you know, what's, what may or may not happen with him. And personally, I don't know. I, I still, I don't know if I don't know or that, like, I don't want to know. I think part of me doesn't want to make theories. I think part yeah. of me wants to sit with Wally's death and have it be good as is. And if there's something else, then I would like that. I would like the death to be meaningful within the show, as meaningful as it's been in the show. And trust the writers to, if they're going to bring Wally back, that it's going to be for a purpose and not just because, hey, we're bringing Wally back because we don't have any other things to think about and we don't have any other plot. Like, that's just not a thing in Young Justice. So, I'm, I don't know. I have so many theories about everything else, including Elongated Man. <laughs> and KF, I, for some reason, I just don't want to, I don't, I don't want to think about it. I just want it to be what it is, I think. I agree. I've been feeling that this whole season. And I think part of it is because it has been so much a part of the fandom since it happened that people within, I distinctly remember within an hour of the finale airing, just people on the internet being like, here are all the ways Wally isn't dead. Uh, And I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, (laughs) But there's then, a lot of good ones out there. Yeah, I'm not discounting any of that. It's just that like I have Yeah. I have existed in a world for 5 plus years where I have accepted this as part of the reality of the show and now I'm just like I'm not sitting here being like, "Well, when are you bringing him back?" I'm like, yeah. "If he comes back, cool. If not, yeah. cool. I just want to see what happens. <laughs> I'm willing right. to just run with it at this point." Yeah. It's just, to me, it's an interesting psychological exercise because you've had a, quite a few emails and stuff even recently. Uh, basically, after Nightmare Monkeys, <laughs> where he played such a prominent role in Nightmare Monkeys. And um, I'm like, why don't I? Why am I not talking about it? And yeah, I with all the other theories and stuff, I'm like, you know what? KF died. And I just, I don't know. I want it to be, I want it to be meaningful as is, I guess. I'm not sure yet. We'll see what they do. And if he ends up, I mean, more Jason Spiezak's in any form is fine with me and (laughs) I want KF to come back. I want him. I just want it to be meaningful. I don't need, you know what I mean? I want it to matter. Yeah. 
And that scene for me does matter so much the way that they handled that and the fact yeah. that like when we do our breakdowns i have a lot of thoughts about how the whole team went through that together and what that means and what that calls back to and the parallels that creates but i kind of love like the way that it's framed at the end where nightwing apologizes because he's like i'm sorry i put you all through that and they all kind of approach it like no thank you for that yeah and that's so ways, you know good <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, need to not. <laughs> I need to not cry over that. We were just thinking about that. I'm in a state today. <laughs> let me let me change subjects. Go not for to it. A, not to elongated man. One of the things that I I had no clue about was this uh, Kirby Jacobs <laughs> doorman. Because I'm like, okay, it's funny that it's Forager doing it. Number one, because he's like saying the whole name out, and uh, I'm like Kirby Jacobs. That does not sound familiar, and he sounds like an older guy from new york or something i'm not quite sure why they have an old new york doorman in san francisco or la i'm not quite sure la hollywood it's yeah yeah it's hollywood. uh so so I, I missed it i didn't look it up the first time i saw it and the second time i saw it, i was like i gotta look this up and see who this person is and uh shout outs to both the the top ones that came up for me uh when i looked it up were actually screen rant and um the dc universe uh easter eggs that are uh uh, done by Joshua Lapin Bertoni. It seems to be, according to to them and some other people on the internet, to be a nod to Jack Kirby, who is Jacob Kurtzberg. Yeah. So the Kirby part, I was like, oh, I wonder if it's a Kirby thing. But I didn't get the Jacob thing. I was like, is it a mash together of two different people that I just don't remember from comic history? Jacob Kurtzberg is what his original name was, which I had no clue about. And, I uh, found so that out when doing to... research for this because I was yeah, going to exactly. ask you and I had written a note that was like, is I it an obscure known. DC character I don't know? And then had a footnote that was just like, or is it just a play on Jack Kirby because yeah. this was his full name? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's probably other people. It's mixed up with a bunch of like uh, LinkedIn and Facebook profiles <laughs> like for other people with the same yeah. name. But the first couple of articles that actually had anything relevant to it were the DC Universe and the and the Screen Rant. And so I skimmed through the Screen Rant one and and uh, they were saying also that the accent of the guy was uh, supposed to be echoey of, of what Jack Kirby's actual accent was from New York and that kind of thing. So anyway, that was pretty cool. I kind of like that. I absolutely agree. Uh, we You have a note down here about the 52 and the 16s, and then there was the 620. So I got nothing. Neither do Same I. Thing. So to explain why we're just saying numbers... <laughs> Uh, in the in the grand tradition of Neil finding all the sixteens, uh, <laughs> right. when there's the video game in the fever dream that Nightwing is playing, uh, the scores that pop up for taking out Parademons and Furies are fifty two, six hundred twenty, and sixteen sixteen. Mm. And Young Justice has made us paranoid about numbers because the first and last are totally normal Young Justice things that I'm willing to accept without question. But the one in the middle sent me into a mini research tailspin. Young Justice <laughs> made me do math and I still have no explanation. I literally, I was like, 620 divided by 16. No, that's nothing. Uh, 16 times 16, nothing. Uh, 52 right. and 16. No, what is this? And like, right. I couldn't come up with anything. So if there's something we're missing, if it's like, I don't know, somebody, somebody message us. If, if it's you guys a fourth know world Kirby reference that we don't know. Maybe. Let us know. And if it was just put in there to make all of us go, what does it mean? Then shout out to the writing team because <laughs> you figured us out. That's right. That's right. The fandom, when presented with any number, will just be like, but what does it mean? Pick it apart. Uh, I'm taking a look, too, at some of my notes. I did not have this answer for the 6620. I have no clue what that is. Rich, I have I have a question for you. If Okay. You, uh, what's what's Infinity Inc.? Oh, did we talk about that a little bit on the last screen? We something? might have, but we finally saw them in this episode, so we have some confirmation of what they are, but I'm yeah, still and not you know what? sure I, what they are. I'll, I'll be honest, like we were we're scrambling to get these uh, episodes recorded because our, our schedules uh, are both really jammed. And so I didn't even look at the credits because somebody's talking in that team, <laughs> which means she must have a name. And and those costumes did did not immediately jump out at me as in the original Infinity Incorporated costumes. So so let's look this let's look this up. 
trajectory is the only member name that's listed. So interviewed by Courtney Whitmore. Background information. Lex Luthor created the Everyman Project, opening the market for regular people to become heroes through genetic enhancements. He also had his own team of them, which he later renamed Infinity Incorporated after buying the rights that name from the estate of Sylvester Pemberton, the original Star Spangled Kid, and later Skyman. The original Infinity Incorporated was a team of children and sidekicks to the heroes. Oh! Oh, I think I remember this arc! Okay, so, so the original Infinity Incorporated was what I talked about in the last episode, uh, was the, the children of Justice Society. So it was the son of the Adam, the original Adam, who was like a five foot tall boxer. <laughs> um, and his son had growth powers and some other stuff uh, because comics. And uh, Al- Alan Scott's two kids and um, Hawkman's son, I want to say. Um, and some others were in that in that team. Um, and then that was, that was back in, I want to say the eighties maybe. And then the infinity incorporated stopped being a a title. And then there was this thing that I was just reading about Lex Luthor, basically giving superpowers to anybody who wanted to have superpowers basically. (laughs) And all I remember from that, from that was there was an episode where like it stopped or like an issue where the powers stopped, like he turned them off and like, a lot of these people had the ability to fly. So there's literally like, I remember like I have this emotional memory of this scene where looking out like a, a, a skyscraper window and people just falling out of the sky. So this infinity incorporated maybe a Lex thing. Did he say something about making their own team again? Because I don't, I didn't hear it. I don't think so. Maybe Infinity Incorporated is the flip side of The Outsiders. It's the Light's version of The Outsiders, and that's what's happening. That's possible. Oh, I forgot all about that arc. And I keep thinking, was it in an, it, wasn't it animated? Is there an animated? I don't think it was animated. It I seems think it pretty was a, dark it was for the, the animated comic. stuff. I feel like they wouldn't the have let them go that got, far. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I'm. Yeah, I think you're right. Like, I mean, all of the animated shows had their dark moments, but I feel yes, like for sure. people yeah. dropping out of the sky, <laughs> right. like all of the censors of the 90s yeah. cartoons would be like, oh, no, right. no, 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 no. Mm, perhaps, maybe no. Perhaps, um, maybe not. Good yes. sir. My memories are all jumbled about this, though. So, yeah, if anybody remembers the numbers, like the numbers to those comics or anything, just uh, shoot us a message on, the, on Twitter and we'll repost it. Yeah. All right. Well, that's... As oh God, I just said, I was about to say that's a dark twist, and I just realized I was quoting Lex. Uh, okay, let's see anything that I that you didn't cover already. Mantis called Mantis uh, way back in the first half, where I was saying that Mantis is a supervillain that works for Darkseid, and that maybe uh, Mac- hey, where's Macom? Who knows, Rich? I just just occurred to me. Uh, we haven't seen him since the last time we saw him. As far as we know, no. maybe he's everyone. He's everyone? That'd be a twist. Like, people are guessing, like, where's McCom this whole season? Then it turns out he's been, like, a potted plant in the corner for, like, weeks. <laughs> Greg and Brandon are like, you liked Failsafe? Let's give you a whole season of Failsafe. None of it's real. No. Um, no. no. So, Mantis. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. So, so, maybe. <laughs> right. So, Mantis has shown Mantis showed up. There you go. I He's guess here. that's all I really had, is that Mantis was there. Um, so let's get to the most important thing, Elongated Man. Uh, <laughs> what do you have to share honestly. about Elongated Man? <laughs> I know a bit about Elongated Man. I read Identity Crisis. As oh, a... <laughs> that is a messed up introduction to Ralph Tibney. Oh, yeah. No, I completely agree. Identity Crisis is one of those comics that I read when I was getting into comics because it was there and you just pick up whatever is available. And I was like, I was probably too young for this comic, but I was just willing to run with it and was like, wow, this is really emotional and dark. And then I grew up and was like, oh, and identity crisis is real weird and has some real, real problems with women and using them properly in a story. But it's it's whatever. We're moving on from that. Or not using them for yeah. a story like, you know, like like using them in the story yeah. like yeah. it's super problematic we're not going to get into there we no, talked I'm just a little saying, bit that's about how I, that's all i know about elongated man 
is that but, that comic yes. that you shouldn't give to children, but it was in, it was in the YA section of my local library. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. Please continue. Tell me something else about a long. Totally day. derailed. I'm sorry. Do not go, do not go there. Don't go read that as your first intro to Ralph Dibney, please. No, don't. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. It's um. So dope. when I was a kid, uh, I had a lot of Flash comics, and it was Barry Allen. And Barry Allen often teamed up in Brave and the Bold with uh, the Elongated Man. And he was a character who, as some of you may know, he is reportedly the second greatest detective next to Batman in the DC Universe. So he's also just got a really big heart. He's just a character who is, he's kind of like a Wally in some ways, like he just enjoys and loves being a hero. But he gains his powers from a, from a, like a, a chemical solution that he drinks. And I think it's called gin gold or something like that. And so uh, it's just one of those little things where, you know, in the background, when you see a character and they, they make a point of nodding to something where you like know that they th- had to think about this, like, okay, we're putting elongated man in the scene. Like number one, why I've been joking the whole episode, but like, why is, why is Ralph in this scene? Why isn't someone else in the scene, but okay, he's in the scene and then he's affected by this thing and it doesn't affect metas the same way it affects non-metas. Who gets affected by that? Well, the lanterns, that all makes sense. And then just this sticking to the old comics and saying like, Ralph is not a mutant. He's not anything like that. Uh, I actually, I mean, I wonder, well, I don't know. So he doesn't have his powers unless he drinks the solution. So it's not like the flash where he like had an accident and then his metagene was triggered. And now he has the powers, no matter what he has to drink the, drink the formula. And the same thing with another character, Johnny quick, who's a flash kind of super speedster character. He had this like super speed formula that he would rattle off. I don't know. So for me, I just thought it was a fascinating little thing to say like, Oh, look, they're making a point to say, look, there are people with powers, not like weapons, like the rings, but powers, people who have actual powers, not metahumans, right? That aren't equipment based. You know what I mean? Like steel yeah. or hardware or something. So. And that aren't yeah. aliens. Right. Or aliens. Know. Yep. As far fair as point. we know. <laughs> fair point. And then what does that mean, actually? That alien thing, right? She's saying metahumans. Like she's saying, like, oh, non metahumans are going to die. And it's like, Okay, so the meta- I thought the metagene was uniquely human. So what happens to McGann? Like Connor's half human. Is Clark a meta human? He appears to be considered a meta human as far as the anti life equation is concerned, because he's in or maybe his physiology allows him to resist it for long periods of time. Like what does that mean? Is it about the X gene, right? Is it about the I don't know. Are you thinking? Is that what you're doing? Yes. That's what we can call it. I went down like a panicked spiral there for a second of like, oh, I wasn't worried about Connor until you just made me very worried about Connor. Oh, Connor doesn't no. get his powers. Connor doesn't get his powers from Lex. He gets his powers from, you know, Clark, obviously. So like, what does that mean? And what does it mean for McGann? I mean, Jean also didn't seem to be negatively affected. Like they didn't, they didn't put him in that shot with the lanterns and elongated man. But then what does that mean? As far as genetics are concerned, if the genetic is the f- genetics are the factor that determines between whether or not Jefferson recovers and Dick doesn't, we'll we'll find out. Next That's week. gotta be the answer. Find out next week. Uh, <laughs> uh, All right, we're gonna have a lot of things to say about these two episodes, including a lot of things to say. I think from Neil. Yes. <laughs> about about Jace when we dive in but we're running low on time here so uh quick crash uh, in the mode and then quick crash in the mode and go from there tell us something we don't know yet sorry bb we can't risk altering the time stream we do that we're all feeling the mode in crash the mode we'll be discussing potential storylines running through our heads based on the episodes released at the time of recording this crash in the mode is based on episodes one through 23 we're already there (sighs) Okay, so the mind control thing affected like a whole solar system, and it implied that it was still going. I can't believe that it moves at the speed of light. 
We don't know right. how far it's gone or how quickly it will get anywhere. I don't know how fast anti-life travels. Do you? <laughs> no. Or how <laughs> how far this device can spread the, the ghost dimension. You know, I mean, it, it hit a whole solar system, which is still pretty brutal. But even at that rate, it's going to take forever, which just me, what it means is in my head is there's heroes and leaguers that are not affected. But who are they going to be? The outsiders and everyone else on Earth, right? And they 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 released like a 30 second like teaser trailer that I watched once and I haven't gone and rewatched. So I don't I know. I have not seen that. The, okay. They D- DC Universe kind of just posted a like, get hyped. It's the finale with a bunch of clips and it's oh, a I bunch of people it. fighting and a bunch of people doing everything. And so I think the setup is going to be everybody who wasn't already there is is going to go and have some sort of a plan. Uh, but I don't know what the plan is. I don't know how we're going to make this work. I'm just over here like trying, like I've been, like you know that thing in in like D&D or any RPG where you get to like, oh, we're going to go to the boss battle now. Right. What do we have at our disposal? Who? Yep. What favors can we call in? What right. NPCs can we get on our side for this fight? Like I'm just doing that for the finale where I'm like, okay, what do we have? So we have the outsiders. 13 wasn't there. Zatanna wasn't there. They could call in Zatanna. Can Zatanna fix this? Could Dr. Fate. Fate fix this? Is right, Dr. Yeah. Fate even on our side? Who do we get? Where is Red Arrow going to help? Who's going to help? Ah, just screaming for forever. Uh, as I try to like just list, I'm like, who do we still have? Jade. Jade. Can we get my? Can we get my? Like, I don't know what a girl <laughs> with some knives and is gonna do. <laughs> I, I, I have no idea what's gonna happen next. It's like, has anyone tried to stab Darkseid? <laughs> has anyone tried to just Gotta stab tr- Darkseid? At least Side? try. Wouldn't it be just so ridiculous if you're like, did you try this? Oh, look, it worked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so it. So let's assume this. Let's just assume blanket. We're not going to know what's going to happen, but assume that like the outsiders is a whole big team, and everybody that's left down Earth is going to come, and they're going to face mind controlled allies. Okay, number one, it's a callback to season one. Yes, it's also a pretty strong callback to season one. Yeah, like definitely a lot of mind control things going on in season one, and manipulation in season two with the scarabs and. You know, that kind of thing and, and free will and choice. And there's definitely a point's been made. <laughs> like Neil and I were talking about this. I don't think you're in that conversation where we're like, hmm, this is this episode specifically was a callback to season one. That was pretty amazing. Yes. The whole continuing the mind control plot, classic supervillains, three seasons. This It feels a little like the Death Star is coming back and returning the Jedi. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I, I kind of see what you mean. I think I saw something. I think I caught like one second of you guys having this conversation at one point or one point in this somewhere along the lines. Because what I kept thinking about was I like I liked how 23 was a callback to all of that, but also a subversion because that entire episode you were thinking, or at least I was, I was like, oh, they're going to go and we're going to see them fight the Justice League again because we got the OG team back together. They're going to go fight the Justice League. We're going to get to see all of our heroes super powered up now as adults fighting off against mind control. Okay, that'll be interesting. They'll probably lose, but it'll be interesting. And then they're like, no, no, you don't even get that chance. I'm like, oh, 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 this is worse. This is so much worse. That's true. That's true. And the season is called Outsiders. So, but what was interesting to me was like, okay, I get it with the OG team, but then there was also Tara and Brion there and because once it's the problem of once you introduce mind control it just becomes like oh we can just mind control anyone at any moment and it's like oh oh this is the easiest way to get anyone out of a situation I guess yeah and I mean I get like the mechanical limitations right if you have like a mind control chip you know the Starro tech so I get those are those are limitations that you can work with narratively I mean this is like all or nothing mind control situation. Yes. I don't know. The biggest, I, 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 I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I think, yes. I think there's definitely narratively like canary debrief wise, a conversation to be had about where they're going to go. Or if they're kind of giving us a, a bait and switch and saying like, Oh, this looks like season one. It looks like the death star is coming back. 
but that's actually, we got three episodes to go and that's not what's going to happen at all. So I think in retrospect of the whole season, well, I mean, I'm happy to give them another, you know, three episodes and see yeah. how the expectations get turned on their ear. But narratively, there's definitely something to just be talked about, about like, okay, same, but different. Okay. It is kind of the same, but it is, I guess a little different, but it's a little bit on the nose. I mean, they're literally out the whole season, Justice League, trying to stop, like trying to make up for the fact they were mind controlled in the first place and that caused them to get mind controlled again. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I Especially because there's three episodes left is part of why I keep being like, I don't know how we're going to fix this because this whole episode feels like a penultimate episode, like second to like... We have yeah. set up the thing, and next week the thing will be resolved. And then you look at the list and you're like, "Oh, there's there's an hour and a half of content. Oh, um, <laughs> I don't know what we do with that. Uh, like I don't. I have, as my note said, I just went. We still have three episodes left, and I cannot think of a solution to this situation. I don't know either. So we'll see. And we've just we've just heard. I don't know. Yet the teaser for the finale. I know that the press people at this point have already seen the finales, the last three episodes, because they get them a week early. They haven't said anything to us. Because so, they can't, and they won't, they and I don't want them to. I, I know, they won't, and they've been very, very good about that. I, I do hear a lot of like, huh, I'm interested to hear your views, like on this last this week's episode that we uh, we heard. It's like, oh... I, I don't know. Though, I don't know. to be fair, we hear that on almost every episode. People That's are fair. like, can't wait to hear what you think about this. And I'm like, okay. Probably the same thing you do. <laughs> Probably. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, if we just have a podcast to talk about it on. Uh, yeah. Like, anyway. you, you can probably guess what we think about certain things if you listened to the whole podcast. <laughs> you listen to the last 190. How many episodes do we have? So many. Going Enough. 200. We're getting close to 200, I think. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. Therapy for us. Thanks for sticking around. Listen to us talk therapy to each other. Yeah, I don't know. We're gonna find out on Tuesday. So the entirety of crashing the mode is just us going. I don't know what's gonna happen. And Actually, here's the here's the irony. People the, are gonna be listening to this scream something after, after the, the answers. Comes out. <laughs> right. But yep, yep. Let's say it out of the watchtower. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. And if all that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S., since we have to look a little harder to find those ones. So it would make our job a bit easier. <laughs> and we'd appreciate it. We would. If you're able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember... Stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. 